Banned books as a title, a man burned on stake as visual bait. I admit uh, that I stressed the scandal-linked aspects of my topic. What I'm really going to talk about is one particular book from the old library and why it has a special significance for St. Edmund Hall. And this is uh, this very book. Oh, perhaps I'll get that out of the way. Um, um, I, I don't dare really to... Uh, so, Johannes Hus and Hieronymus Prag Opera. And um, I, well, uh, I asked to be put last so that afterwards um, we could leaf through a little bit of uh, the book. It's a quite a good stand for it. Um, and then afterwards we can take it up together to the old library so anybody who hasn't been um, up there can help put it back into the context of uh, the library. <coughs> this mighty tome provides a visual link to rebellious religion, an important aspect of our college history. <coughs> it connects to movements considered heretical, which were pro uh, propagated by fellows of the hall, and for which actually one of the 15th century principles died on stake. This is one of the connections between the woodcut from the book and the hall that was promised in my advertisement. More are to come. What you see here in front of you is the first edition of the collected works of Jan Hus, the Czech counterpart to England's John Wycliffe. They were written in the 15th century, but first printed in 1558 in Nuremberg, in combination with letters of recommendation by Martin Luther. The title reads, Johannes Hus, et Hieronymi Pragensis Confessorum Christi Historia. We just heard about the term, and it's, it's actually quite an interesting point to discuss how the concept of Historia in this title relates what, to what Emily uh, Winkler was talking about as um, thinking of Historia. Um, at Monumenta, so the history and documents of John Hus and Jerome of Prague the confessores, the true witnesses of Christ. Nunc demum in lucem prolata et edita, now finally brought to light and edited. Cum testimonies multorum eruditione prestantium, with the testimonials of many outstandingly learned persons, meaning Luther, in fact. Um, so uh, that was, um, uh, that links in a way to uh, Thomas Kittel's talk about how to sell a book, uh, what to um, put on, on the front page and how to propagate it. Blanca Treppert, um, our librarian, has kindly granted me permission to take it down for today's talk, since for my topic it is vital to have the material aspect of the book, its impressive size, weight, and the traces of use right in front of you to understand the mighty symbolism of books to represent ideas. And after the talk, we'll take it back. The tome normally stands on the shelf just 10 meters away from here um, at the north end of the historic collection of St. Edmund Hall. The ante chapel downstairs and the library upstairs are linked with two stacks of books as columns. Um, Will Donaldson, uh, our chaplain, um, likes to interpret this as an advice in stone to the passing students to connect praying and studying. And this he is certainly in keeping with the early history of the hall that had very much the firm link between um, confessing religion and studying books. This starts actually right with St. Edmund himself who died in defiance of King Henry III in 1240 on his way to Rome. It was continued by two principals of the 15th century who were involved with radical Bible study movements in the 15th century. So this study movement was a pan-European phenomenon. In England, it was associated with John Wycliffe, who had been banned from Oxford in 1381. William Taylor, principal of the hall in 1405, was condemned as a follower of Wycliffe and burned in Smithfield in 1423, 
an Oxford martyr predating those commemorating, commemorated at the Martyrs Memorial um, by a century. His student and successor as principal of the hall, Peter Payne, took the criticism of the establishment a step further. He wrote with a group of Oxford friends a letter of support to Jan Hus, the most outspoken figure for church reform in Europe, and went then himself to Bohemia to join the radical wing of the Hussites. He was present in Prague when Hus preached some of the sermons collected in this volume before Jan Hus was being summoned to the Council of Constance where he was burned on stake in 1415 together with a couple of followers, among them Jerome of Prague, who is shown in the woodcut I used as a poster. Peter Payne picked up the mantle of Hus. He put his Oxford training to good use, not for Brexit, but rather for arguing that the church should get rid of its wealth and rethink its social commitment, a stand which re reflects not only Hus's position, but also the underlying premises of St. Edmund, of Abington, um, on whose ideas, um, with whose ideas Peter Payne was familiar from his days at the hall. He want, uh, went as an advocate to the next council, that of Basel, to argue for the cause of the reformers. And was, it was reported that um, actually Peter Payne's arguments for the um, uh, radical wing of the Hussites, with whom he had traveled from Prague, were some of the most decisive at uh, the council. Another person to pick um, up in a similar manner the mantle of Jan Hus was Martin Luther. This year sees the quincentenary of the publication of the 95 Thesis, which addressed the need of reform in a church marred by greed and post-truth. This was the reason for the addition of works of Hus together with documents of his life in 1558. And now we are back to um, this volume. It was published um, with actually several prefaces uh, by Luther. Luther at that point was um, already dead, but um, the idea was to construct um, a clear historical link between two reform movements. Um, uh, the saying went, you were able to burn the goose, which is the name Hus in Czech, Czech um, but you won't be able to uh, burn the swan, namely uh, Luther. So Luther's interpretation of whose writing made it um, appropriate reading for uh, um, across Europe. So it traveled back to England and is in uh, several of the college libraries here on the recommendation of uh, Luther. Um, so this book was printed a uh, hundred years before this library was set up, but the setup of the library came out of a similar uh, 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 set of mind, uh, in a way, because uh, the two principles um, connected with setting up the library and connecting it, uh, connecting chapel and uh, studying, were very much also in um, reform movement. Thomas Tully, um, who uh, introduced the rule that every alumnus had to give five uh, pounds uh, to uh, buy books for the hall, and then uh, Stephen Penton, whose name is above uh, the door, who found the place for it. And I've I shown um, some of the early books which can be still seen from the chains. And um, it's fascinating to see that the library continued to thrive on donations and donations that were given in the spirit in which the library was founded, namely that of reform. So um, this book um, didn't enter as on the first strata of books, the library, but um, was acquired from uh, Germany where it had belonged to um, a doctor in philosophy and archdeacon of Glauchau. And um, this uh, library of uh, uh, Stöckhardt 
then um, entered the English market through the um, big uh, grand tour traveling of Oxford scholars. So an alumnus from Oxford, um, Lawrence Heapy, bought it for uh, the library, or rather left uh, the money and his own library to, um, the, to St. Edmund Hall to complete um, the collection that had been uh, built up. So um, it's not one of uh, the chained books, but it's uh, very much in keeping in a, uh, and it makes a good addition to what uh, the library was set up to show. Um, I um, will look through the book and show you some of uh, how it's built up the argument, but uh, just as a final thought, we will have a debate later this afternoon of what 2016 means for higher education. What this term really is a stark reminder is of the engagement of the whole in movements of reform and to stand up against social injustice and be prepared to um, take the consequences, even if we hope it won't be another principle on stake. <laughs> Thank you.